Now, is this dangerous? Yep, very, very dangerous. Uh, ramp, ramp riding especially. Yeah, which is your specialty, right? Yep. Uh, flat land, which is tricks on the ground. It's dangerous, but it's, it's really technical. And it, it takes a lot of balance, finding balance points, different stuff like that. Where ramp riding, I always like for the thrill, being in the air. If you try a trick, you have two options. You either do it or you crash. something different. We didn't fit the mold of your typical athlete. I tried other traditional sports, you know, but I never really accepted the traditional stick and ball. It wasn't what I wanted to do. But I was never a team sport kind of guy. When I was younger, I just wasn't interested in the traditional ball sports. I think BMX was an alternative to traditional sports. I didn't have the ability to get to practice or get picked up from practice. I was playing hockey and uh, my sister at the same time was figure skating. She was an Olympic hopeful at that young age. We just didn't have the money to keep two people on the ice. I mean, ice is expensive, so I stopped playing hockey and I started riding my bike all the time. Ride my big wheel in the driveway and my dad's like, look, I gotta use the driveway right now, do some work. I'm like, well, where can I ride? And he's like, well, just go ride in the backyard. And I'm like, but I wanted to set up a jump. He's like, well, see that old table down in the backyard? Just cut a couple legs off, and you can use that as your jump. I'm like, all right. So that's what we did. Uh, I should have known, I guess, when he was about 18 months old one day, um, he followed my husband up to the roof. He climbed, actually climbed a ladder at 18 months old. He loved the height and the thrill of it. And I was terrified when I saw his little white baby shoes climbing up this ladder. And uh, ever since then, we should have known probably that he was going to find something in life to give him a thrill. What's interesting is I, w I started out racing motocross. I have to admit this, my big hero as a young boy was Evil Knievel. And when we did jumps, it was always doing Evil Knievel. You had to pull the front end up real high and see how far you could go. Uh, it was Evil Knievel. I mean, it was Evil Knievel. We wanted motorcycles. So. Motocross looks inside. He played the test. Evil Knievel. Hey, God. And of course, the second best thing is bicycles. And we had bicycles, and they were, you know, ragtag, rickety bicycles, but they were bicycles. We made these things called bombers, which were like old 20 inch twin frames with like ape hanger bars. And so you go to the dump, you bring back piles of. Uh, any bike parts you could find in the strap pile. We'd go and, and get parts that we found at the local dump, get coaster brake guts. Like I just had like a little girl's bike. My dad welded a top tube on it, so it looks like I'm like a BMX bike. I asked my mom for a bike, and she got me this uh, $165 uh, Raleigh Rampart. And I had a 16-inch uh, KMX, and it had a gas tank and stuff. It was like, you know, BMX bike, banana seat. I think I got my first real BMX was a Peugeot and it was a 78 Puffy Pro Thunder. That thing breaks and you got to get upgrade and then I think my next bike was like a Teen Murray and you know, I was all fired up to get that thing. And, and then modifying it was the next thing. Oh, I got to get a Pro Neck. I got to get some Redline uh, handlebars. 
I gotta get um, some rad pads. But my first real bike was an 85 GT Performer. With mags, it had yellow tough wheels on it. Pipe insulation for pads. Maxi cross cranks, they were, that was it. You know, I had uh, anodized red and blue brakes. And... It was my definition of what a BMX bike was. Like a super goose that had mags. Dad took the bike to the shop and it came back with knobby tires on it. It's like, wow, knobby tires, we can be like dirt bikes. And we would go out and ride around on the cow paths around our house. We were not your average kids. We were setting off on a mission of sorts on our BMX bikes. But the one thing we didn't realize was that this mission would take the rest of our lives to complete. It was just this hunger for BMX. All we wanted to do was ride and find other kids that were involved in the same thing. BMX, I mean, I just lived it. I got into BMX probably after like jumping over curbs and logs when I was 10, 11, 12. In 83, 84, 85, you couldn't turn your head without seeing a kid on a BMX bike. Everyone had a bike and it was kind of like, I need to be riding too if I want to fit in with these kids to be in like this social circle. 85, 86, you'd drive down the street and if there was a kid on a freestyle bike, like, er, it breaks, like you were going to talk to him. You all had that common bond that you rode a bike. Your bike was your transportation. It was, it was how you got around town. It was, it was your identity. It was your prized possession. It was what made you who you were. It was a source of independence. You know, you basically go to school, you come home from school, you get on your BMX bike and you ride it until the sun goes down. Maybe you come home, eat dinner, you get back out and ride your bike. It's long before, you know, kids were hooked on video games. <laughs> you know, you're pedaling at this like little two by six or two by four, like full speed, <laughs> counting that you're gonna hit it and go up it, you know, and you did. And I ducked down and compressed, and the ramp exploded. Just snapped right in half. That was painful. Around the same time, there were some kids in my neighborhood who rode 10 speeds, and they could do a wheelie for like 50 feet or something like that. And I'm like, I want to be that kid. We used to count telephone poles. Be like, how many telephone poles could you ride a wheelie? You know, I remember standing up, <laughs> riding wheelies, like standing up, going like 30 miles an hour, cranking, trying to go, you know, four, four telephone poles, five telephone poles. Guys had motorcycles across the street, and they had like a couple of like little jumps and stuff like that, like a little track. And I used to just love it. I was like, yeah, trying to like make all the motorcycle sounds and everything. I got really pumped up about it. Before you know, it, we had, you know, there was six or seven guys that all, that's all we did is dirt jump. And you know, this is, you know, in sixth grade. You know, um, yeah, that's all. That's that's all we did. We we go to school. We come back. Work on the track. We had a two-man gate. We got an old two-by-eight, and we put some stakes into the ground and some hinges with an old axe handle. And we built a starting gate. And we were running our own two-man races in the woods. The BMX media opened our eyes up to what was possible on these bikes, and we dissected every inch of those magazines. And those possibilities awoke a creativity and an intensity in us that we didn't know we had yet. Well, I lived in between two general stores, and uh, I'd always go look at these uh, magazines in the magazine rack. In the 70s, there was a lot of people customizing vans. So I'd look at these cool magazines with all these customized vans. But one day, what is this? Bicycle motocross action. What? That was a crucial time. It was like, time to put the subscription money down and subscribe to BMX Action. Uh, but I remember like seeing like September 1983, like uh, uh, BMX Plus, and that was the year that I was really like, oh, man, BMX, that's where it's at. There's a color magazine on the newsstand, and so I bought this thing, and I mean, I wore it out. Read everything word for word, cut photo photos out of it, put them up on the wall. You know, we were running with it. I remember I got my first freestyle magazine, like seeing people doing foot endos, and hitting jumps and I was just like, oh my God, I was just blown away and I'm like, I have to do that. Our whole entire influence was definitely the magazines. And you're flipping through these magazines and everything was based on the West Coast. And there was like the whole surf culture. You know, you're seeing your idols wearing like checkered vans or they're wearing um, jams, flowered shorts and all that, and Ocean Pacific apparel. And you thought it was the coolest thing. It wasn't just riding, it was, it was where they're from, it was the riding that they were doing on the level that they were doing it, and it was the way that they were dressing. And I mean, I think in the end, that ended up being almost as much of the dream that we were chasing as the riding itself was just living out west and, and living that dream. I can remember those days of putting on 
upwards of 30 miles a day on my bike, riding from jumps to ramp. And you know, back in those days, of course, everybody, nobody had a discipline, a specific discipline. Everybody was was doing everything. You know, you, you rode ramps, you rode dirt, you rode flatland. You did just did it all. There wasn't really a distinction between racing and freestyle, or you know, uh, everybody did both. And we just did, you know, everything for fun. And uh, so most of the riders would race in the weekend and do tricks during the, during the week. Most of us weren't satisfied with just riding our bikes, and racing seemed like the next logical progression in the sport. But racing had guidelines and racing had structure. Neither of these were what we wanted, because ultimately, we didn't want any rules on how to ride our bikes. In 19, it had to be again around 1980, 81, the Hopkinton BMX track, um, there was a little jump off, off, off to the side of the first tabletop, and we called it the pit jump. And the nice thing about it, it was it was beach sand on the other side. It was it was really fine beach sand, and you could get a lot of momentum going from the start where the race started and hit that pit jump. Because you could fly off of this thing and you landed in a huge pile of sand. And so if you made a mistake, it wasn't as big a deal. And I didn't know him at the time, but there was this kid, Curtis Jackson and a few other guys, and they were just flying off this thing. And I'm like, I want to do that. These guys, we just watch them wheelie the track and do all these crazy jumps and get air. And as a little kid, he looked over and went, wow, I want to be just like that guy. I made it a point when I raced to not only jump a lot at the end of the race day, to just enjoy myself on the track and jump everything. But I made it a point to wheelie every track that I raced on. Wasn't successful, but I would wheelie almost every obstacle that was in front of me. I did the whole thing for, for messing around doing tricks anyway. So the notion of like going really fast and staying low to the ground on the jumps was so such a strange concept. I knew you had to do that to win, but it really wasn't, you know, it wasn't my thing. The problem, my problem anyway, was that I sucked at racing. Um, you know, you're constantly coming in last and second to last. I think I placed third once only because everyone in front of me crashed and I just kept riding around them. You know, so, you know, I was that guy that would get last, but I'd be the one jumping, doing no footers over the jump. <laughs> like, you know, doing little tabletops and... The, at first, I wanted to get involved with BMX racing because I thought that that was more of a competitive type of sport at the time. Uh, but, but as I went along, I thought that uh, maybe I could get into trick riding because trick riding was a way to show off and actually get girls. While I might have gotten more into racing if I had been able to get to the track a lot, it just wasn't feasible for me to get there. But, you know, a big, flat, quiet street was right out in front of my house all the time. So I went down with my Haro Master at the time. I had my screw on Skyway axle pegs. We got down to the racetrack and go to sign up, get all the paperwork, and there's Tom Kyander saying, well, you're gonna take your axle pegs off. Well, what do you mean? Well, you can't race with axle pegs. Nice race in an eight and nine expert action. Yeah, in a nutshell, I showed up at uh, the race one morning, kind of gung-ho, kind of not, and they're like, the rep said, you gotta take the pegs off, and I said, no, that's right, I'll just, sit aside and watch my friends race and, and left them on and that was it. We started to feel like square pegs in a round hole at the racetrack. We began to enjoy riding the wooden makeshift ramps more than racing. So what started as something to keep us occupied between motos became a full-time obsession. Are you that world famous kid Josh? Um, well, as a matter of fact, I'm Dennis McCoy and I'm not too tall. In fact, I'm kind of short, but I'm a hip hop and member of the newest sport. It's freestyle. 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 The itself was so new, I mean, it's so progressive, and we were on the cutting edge of that progression. I think back in the 80s, we weren't sure where this was going, if it was going to be a fad or like a lot of other things in the 80s were. This is a new sport. It started about 10 years ago in California, and it's just recently spread uh, to the Northeast, where it's becoming more and more popular. You could see these kids having fun, and these kids all wanted to look at it, see what it was, and 
you know, it was just so different than your mainstream baseball and basketball and football. And uh, we saw these kids doing tricks, and we thought, oh, let me, let's try that. So we'd go home after between races because you only race once a week, but you can do tricks every day. The sport itself just lent itself. We were doing something that we were ridiculed for, you know, riding your bike. You know, what are you, what are you wasting your time doing tricks for? What could be more natural than a youngster and a 20-inch bike in a place to ride around and have a good time. We were either trading in our race bikes or modifying them part by part until they became BMX freestyle bikes. We transformed this passion for being fast into learning any trick that we get our eyes on, or maybe even inventing a trick of our own. Got into racing a little bit, but I always enjoyed the, the freedom, the expression of freestyle, hence the name. When I was like, 13 maybe like everyone just started getting out of it and um, and that was when like that Bob Haro you know freestyle little book came out and uh, we studied that book religiously it was, it was, it was, it was on the BMX action BMX action always had a how to yeah. the rock walk was like the first thing and Bob Bob Haro was my hero I and mean, he was just like you know every month He'd have a new trick that would come out. It'd be like a rollback slider or rock walks or whatever it was. And that magazine would come out and we'd be outside within 10 minutes later until it was dark, you know, until we got called in inside. So there was a never ending list of tricks that you wanted to learn and there was never enough time to learn them all. And just as soon as you thought you had it, a new magazine would come out with a brand new how to and then all of a sudden you're playing catch up again. But you never really knew the mechanics that it took to do a lot of these things and you kind of had to figure it out for yourself and it took months and months to do this. And then, you know, you get together with your friends and you're trying to figure out like, how the heck did he do that? And you're like, how do you bunny hop? I mean, a 10 year old kid with a 30 pound bike or whatever, no, they were probably like 28 pounds, but still, trying to bunny hop was a hilarious like, thing to watch. Man, I remember forever trying tail whips, tail whips, tail whips, and then finally nailing one. Must have tried like a thousand before I finally nailed my first tail whip. And I remember R.L. Osborne uh, doing front wheel hops. It was like a big sequence, and I remember it said uh, something to the effect of, you know, R.L.'s max has been 48 or 49, see if you can do more. And it was like, oh my God, you know, you're getting so close, you know, you got 10, 15, 20. Next thing you know, you're like 45, and all of a sudden you hit 50. It's like, yes, I did more than R.L. Osborne. Even though that photo shoot was probably, you know, six months to a year previous, I remember just stopping at 100. <laughs> um, so you see them doing, you're like, okay, so it is possible. Like at first, you know, you think that only pros can do a lot of these tricks. Like, and the magazines would say that, like, don't try this, it's for pros only. And you'd be kind of like, okay, we won't. So we took off and we, we traveled all over the United States and of course we were in the East Coast. And at that time, you know, there wasn't a scene and um, it was, you know, basically being a pioneer. You're out there riding, doing demos and turning people onto something they really haven't seen before. So we'd, we'd been seeing pictures of Bob Haro in bicycle motocross action, little how-tos, photo sequences. Then, somewhere along the line, we found out Bob Haro was going to be in Boston. And lo and behold, I see Bob Morales and Bob Haro walk through and into a bathroom. So I immediately, I shot right into the bathroom. Bob Morales disappears into a stall. He starts changing into his leathers. Bob didn't have a stall to go into, so he just dropped his pants and started changing into his leathers and his boxer shorts. And I saw him and attacked him, verbally just question after question after question. When's your new frame coming out? What else do you have going on? What's Haro doing? And he was the nicest guy. He sat there and answered every single question and was, seemed just as enthusiastic about everything as I was. Bob had his like, it was the, it was the prototype Haro Master. Um, no stickers on it, you know, he had his Haro plate on. I mean, the, the classic photos of him from like the early 80s. And I was hooked. Unbeknownst to me at the time, uh, Chris Lashua was in the audience, Joe Johnson was in the audience. All these riders that would later sprout out of the area and grow these pockets around the Northeast. And I think that was probably a pretty big spark that, that started the whole 
fever for doing all this trick riding. But to have RL and Buff there, that was a whole nother level. I think for a lot of us, you know, for a lot of kids, that was probably the first time they ever saw them in person. So they were rock stars. I mean, walking in the door, they were rock stars. These guys were, they were in the magazines. They're doing all the tricks. They're doing all the stuff. Everyone knew who they were. And it was just an incredible thing to see and have them come to Massachusetts. Here we had some local teams doing shows, like Jocks Jag, Harbro, and the Cruz Brothers. The, the four guys I can remember, and this, this started at the, uh, the Weymouth BMX track. Um, four guys showed up, and they had a ramp set up, quarter pipe, and uh, it was the Cruz Brothers. And Bill Curtin, uh, Curtis Jackson, Mark Nason, and Andy Johnson. Those four guys were all there. They were doing a professional show um, for the racetrack. And I saw that, and I was just hooked. And yeah, that's when it really got going, is, is just seeing somebody else do it, knowing that I could do it on my own, I didn't have to rely on other people, and just took off. Uh, that was truly the spawning point for so many of us. But it, it planted that seed you know, in their heads that, hey, this is something I can do, I want to do, I will do. And little by little, the Whitensville crew sprouted out, um, Freestyle Control, all the different groups, the guys out in, in the East Long Meadow area, guys up in New Hampshire, everybody that came into that original show went out and they spread out through New England and started creating all of those little pockets of interest. And from that, the scene grew. Once we saw these factory teams come to town, we realized we had to up our game. And the first step was building ramps. When, whenever I saw Bill, you know, rock walk across the parking lot, there were no rules. It, it was just, it was wide open. It, there was nothing that you couldn't dream of, and, and they were doing it. And, and we all just stood there like in awe. And all we wanted to do was just get rid of our BMX bikes and just ride their ramps. That was just it. We wanted their ramps. We wanted what they had. The first couple quarter pipes we made weren't too fun to ride. They were pretty wrong. It was, it was a big plywood deck or something that he had leaned against the uh, this above ground pool with a little kicker on the bottom of it. And so we were going up and we were turning around on that and it was just... Didn't, didn't, didn't. But the bump, bump, <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Because you hit it in the plywood, it did duh. That's why everybody hates it. Not the only one who's done that. The thing isn't built right. We were so key on making something, a quarter pipe or half pipe, and we found a whole trailer load of two by fours. Now, you know, we're scraping and scratching to throw a few bucks together to buy a set of grips or something. We're gonna grab all this wood when we can grab it, you know? And the only way to get it there was take this old trailer that we had, no car, nothing. We just lifted up one end, the guy would get on the back and push it right down the railroad tracks all the way to Dennis's house from, from God knows where. It was like a mile and a half, two miles. Some guys weren't worried about getting caught. Myself, I was chicken. I didn't want to get caught. I didn't want to face the consequences. But I was also the recipient of wood being delivered, so to speak, at very odd hours of the night. Eddie Fiola came out and um, held this clinic. And when I was, you know, I went went through the line to get my autograph, to get his autograph. And I was asking him how to build the quarter pipe, and he just, you know, he he told me how to, you know the radius into the side of the plywood using an eight, eight, eight foot long string on it with a pencil on the end of it and turn the radius of the plywood and you know it uh i instantly went home and i was you know so disappointed i didn't think of it earlier because it was it was so key we read in the book that if you mix some silica sand in with the paint when you finish the ramp it would give it a little bit of traction well being from new england we didn't have any silica sand handy but we did have this road sand on the side of the road after one of our harsh winters and we sprinkled that in the paint and we mixed it up and painted the ramp it was like 80 grit when you fell on that thing it would tear you to pieces eventually we got it right and then we really started becoming ramp riders back then we were all learning how to ride it first of all um, and nobody was really 
bet on the other person and it was more push each other to go higher. And we'd always have either a pole marker or somebody standing up there just kind of kind of giving you that feel of, all right, I can get to, you know, his waist or maybe his chest, you know, if I, you know, and then you're always looking to go over the head, of course. The backyard sessions were just, those are the best times. That was where your buddies were over, you're riding, you're learning tricks, you're trying to one-up each other, and in some cases, you you could just feed off of each other and just take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and ultimately, everybody would leave the session with something a little bit different or something new. We just rode hard. I mean, there'd be a lot of kids there, you know, watching, but just probably like four or five guys that were really riding hard, and you know, then a lot of the kids from town were just hanging out. But yeah, it was just, you know, what can we do today? You know, that would be harder, or bigger than it was yesterday, and that was it. So we made the big drive down to Connecticut and go to this BMX track and there's this uh, dirt contest area with a quarter pipe on each end. But it quickly progressed. It was fun doing the competitions. Those early ones, I remember being so embarrassed. The East Long Meadow, I think that video is out there now, where I'm just like racing around back and forth. You know, trying to fill the time. I didn't know what else to do. You know, the early contests, it's just like, there you go. There's some ramps. You can hit them. You can do some ground tricks if you want. They didn't break it up into flat land or ramp. Um, and having that sense of like, oh, I can do that. Or I could take that and do it a little better. And that's sort of how it all started. And of course it was Ron and myself starting those first competitions, those early competitions that started bringing that next level the following season. And the one year they had the GT team come down, it was uh, Ron Wilkerson, Rich Avela. And this was like kind of a, a big deal and uh, Ron Stebbin came down with his crew. You know, I was kind of like big man on campus at that point. Then these kids came down and I was completely blown away by how good they were. And the thing that like completely like was a game changer for me as far as how, ki how far these kids evolved was uh, Dennis Langless doing a 360 air on the GT team to like a rollback. I was completely floored. To start competing locally uh, was just so intense. It was, you know, every time you were out in, into a thing like this, it was a time to absorb as much information about BMX as you could because now you had it all around you and right at your fingertips and at your disposal. You'd get your cassette tape over to the dude and you'd do your three or four minute run and try not to get hurt and try to do your best tricks and save your best ones for last. I think back then the competition, the brand competition aspect of BMX was really alive, you know? And it was, it was fun rivalry. Um, Paul Delario and Dennis Langlace were neck and neck, if you will, in the, in the freestyle realm in the day. They were the top two guys in the pro class, um, almost on their own level because they were, the only, they were the only guys that were getting, you know, big air. You know, they were constantly pushing each other and, um, you know, it, it was like, you know, Paul win one, Dennis would win one. Paul Winwin, Dennis Winwin. And in a lot of ways, it mirrored the sponsorship rivalries. Paul rode for Haro, Dennis rode for GT. Kick turn on the small ramp. Bananas go by. Whoa, Millie! That boy soars! <laughs> A delayo! <laughs> there he goes again. What's gonna happen this time? Whoa, Nelly! That boy is catching some air! I wouldn't call it bitter rivalry, but I guess that's kind of how it was because we were all trying to just outdo each other. Um, and, and the fact that there were competing teams or competing brands, if you will, um, you know, it was just that, that die hard, you know. We're for Team Harrow. That, that's it. That's all there is. There's, there's nothing else in the world. And, and, you know, you should be riding one. And that's all there was. And then, you know, you've got Team GT and, you know, are you Harrow guys? You know, this, this Harrow brand, this isn't, this means nothing. So there, it was always the, you know, one up on, on, t on top of each other. It, it, was, it was definitely there. And then we've got Torleo 
crouching table chop area up there. Pop up, fly in. One hander, and he's full extension. What's he gonna do now? The famous reverse drop in. This move is nuts, and he pulls it off. You know, their group was over there, and we were over here. Like the Matt Bennett's, the Dennis Langlands, the Jeff Larson's over here, and it was intense. And over here was Paul Delario and his crew over here, and, and I, I, I can see them in the corner right now. They're over there, they're scheming their, their thing, and you know, like a boxing match, he's over there, and they're, they're patting Paul on the back, and I'm over here, and you know, we're, Jeff and I are like, get him, let's get him, got him, we got him. High airs, you know, it's, it's really exciting. And uh, when the com competition was done, you know, we both got together, shook hands with smiles. And, uh, you know, the rivalry's there on the competition, but afterwards it was just, you know, we were great friends. The brand rivalry, I think, was just friendly, as friendly competition, you know. And, um, you know, GT is a, is a Southern California brand. They were our biggest rival for sure and they were a much bigger brand than Haro Bikes was for sure back in the day and um, so it was fun for us to kind of if as we you know did better in competitions and things like that you know we would send friendly things to GT like a cake or something that said we're number one you know we were we were a little you know I was 27 year old guy 26 year old guy with a brand and you know I didn't think of any liability liability we're just having fun the BMX Freestyle Fire was lit in New England. Unfortunately, that fire was not nearly warm enough to get us through some obstacles that the riders in California knew nothing about. And then there was the weather. It was freaking cold. Ah! You know, and wintertime was another thing. We rode, didn't matter, summer, winter, you know, rain, shine. You know, somehow we were riding. It wasn't just like, oh, you riding. It was like, where you riding? The East Coasters were working so much harder and probably probably a little more aggressively. I was thinking about the pros in our area, like those guys are working their ass off because that, we're, all the time we're in the magazines, we're looking at the pros in the West Coast where they have this beautiful weather year round. And now we have these pros on the Northeast and the East Coast. These guys are friggin' rad and they gotta deal with the conditions we gotta deal with. Yeah, you know, we were willing to do whatever it took to keep riding every day. Even if that meant if we didn't have an indoor place to ride, we would then get thermals on, five sweatshirts, gloves, ski hat, and go out and ride in the snow. If, if you had to do an hour of tricks with slippery tires, that's better than nothing. Any time that you got, you had to get out there because if you didn't, the whole sport was gonna pass you by. You had to ride every single day in some way. But the real, the, the guys that really ride are gonna find the way to ride. They're gonna go out and do what they have to do. From New England, you know, we can <laughs> handle the weather. In the snow, when the snow would get really bad, what I'd do is I'd put on like two layers of clothes, the clothes I wanted to ride in, then the clothes I wanted to walk in the blizzard in. I'd wrap my bike up in trash bags, put on some ratty sneakers, put the good sneakers in the backpack, and carry my bike a couple miles to a parking garage just to ride flatland. I do remember we actually would have tarps over the ramps in the winter so the snow wouldn't fall on the ramps at times. Um, of course the tarp would collapse once in a while and the snow is heavy. Uh, you try different methods to get the, if there's ice that ends up forming on your ramp, you try different ways to get it off and out there with the hair dryer melting it off. I remember, like, you know, we'd, we'd complain because, in a lot of ways we complained just because we were, we, were, we, were, we were just envious, you know, these guys in California, they could ride all the time. But in some ways, we were hungry, man. You know, like, we, we, like, it made it even more critical that, man, when you finally did find a place to ride and it was dry, you put in the time and you made it count. And there was something, there's something about the intensity of that, of that, like, adventure that, like, it's one of the reasons I think that the guys who did well really did well. Because you had to just, you really had to want it. We never stopped. You know, the, the, winter was a, the winters were rough and the summers were rough too. We didn't care if it was, you know, lightly raining out, we'd still go out and ride. If it was freezing cold out, well, we'd kind of go behind a building or something to, to break down the wind. A lot of people would go out and they would say, you know, I gotta wait for the sunny day. I would, I would say, there's no sunny day. You have to deal with the rainy day. You have to deal with the sunny day. You have to deal with the, 
the day where you're tired. You have to deal with the day when you're, you got all your ducks in line. You have, to, you have to be able to handle all of it. Local teams were doing more shows and for bigger sponsors. New England started to emerge as one of several freestyle hotspots outside of Southern California. We're here to do something that looks like fun and frankly, that's what it is. The pivotal moment was definitely, you know, seeing the, the GT Mountain Dew trick team at, uh, at the Zares across the street from East Province High School. We knew of the guys in the area, Dennis Langley, Greg Maycumber, Chris Lashua. This just absolutely lit the world on fire. Thanks, but we got the Mountain Dew GT trick team and it's my pleasure to introduce them to you. And that's pretty much what kind of got me interested in, in when I saw them doing the tricks. At that point, I said, you know, that's pretty neat, that's pretty cool. At that point, I was trying to figure out, well, how can I get a, a set of uh, axle pegs to, to do that or a, or a good set of brakes to be able to do those tricks that those guys were doing. And, uh, you know, going from that, I think that was the point where, you know, we, uh, we really had to um, bring it to the next level. It gave me sort of a goal. It showed me this is what I want to go and do. And I remember walking out of the building with my dad on that last day and he said, well, what do you think? And I said, I'm going to get on that team someday. I don't know how yet, but I, I'm going to get on that team. The shows were happening like every weekend. As a result of the shows happening all the time, he was able to go to GT and say, hey, we're doing you know, 300 shows in you know, this amount of time. And so him and Sean Buckley got together and uh, bikes started coming our way. With Mountain Dew and GT coming on board for us, it was, it was something that catapulted us. I mean, it, it took us from zero to 60 in three seconds. What was cool about getting hooked up with, with Bob Haro and Haro, you know, Haro Designs um, was the fact that it started opening doors for us. They must have known something was big. They knew something was up. I don't even think they knew how big it was. So um, for Bill to, you know, be talking with Bob Haro about, you know, our team and saying, you know, hey, look, we got a really hot bunch of riders here that you need to have as, you know, your East Coast spokesman because, you know, you can't be out here all the time and we can't be out there. So it was just, it was kind of a natural uh, growth. Don't ride your bike on the school grounds. You may injure some of the other children at play. And above all, never be a show-off. It doesn't pay. In addition to needing competitors for those early contest days, another essential role became apparent. Every competition and show needed an MC. There were no applications or tryouts for this task, and the only requirement was a willingness to embarrass yourself until you figured out exactly how to get the crowd pumped. First of all, I was not a technician, and I'm, I'm going to say it right now, and if anybody thinks that they can be both a technician and an enthusiastic announcer, I think I'm waiting to still find someone that can do it. Because when you see the big now professional ramp shows, and you see the big ramp competitions, you can see the guy, Dennis McCoy, and explaining each trick and knowing how to do it. But when you're announcing, trying to have fun, trying to get people involved, I'd, I would know about six tricks and that was about it. I just didn't know what uh, they were and they evolved so rapidly. So imagine yourself trying to announce Darren Pelio's tricks. Well, a Pelaroni, right? We knew that. You know, in a, in a, in a nose uh, pick and things like that, I could pick up. But some of these are just too sophisticated. So what could I say? Well, you know, he's whipping that bike like he's whipping up some mashed potatoes, you know? And of course the riders enjoyed it and the people saying, yeah, that looks like about what whipping up mashed potatoes would be. Uh, yes, my dear. To California. Mm-hmm. Oh, I guess they'll be going out through Dedham and Framingham, you know. Mm-hmm. There was always a, a yearning to go where the action was. And the action, the perception was that California is where it was all happening. And we go to Venice Beach, Really beautiful, really uh, all the all the freaks were out at night kind of thing. Venice Beach was crazy. It's it was pretty much. All I remember was just chaos. Just you know, you're you, you just okay. Here you go, ride your turn. Go. You know, there's not really any organization to it. People were hungry at that contest. I don't think the intimidation factor was there. I think it was like you know, let's just go get them. You know, we wanted what they had, and you know, still to this day, it's still kind of you know in my own head. Um, you know, we just wanted what they had and we wanted to knock them off of the perch. It's not like, I think that we had this expectation 
that the riders in California all had this huge bag of tricks, which is like baloney. You know, what it was was is that this guy had two or three tricks, that guy had two or three tricks, that guy had, now of course they did other things too, but when you would look at it, you know, you would think like, oh my God, they all have it all. And it was, it was more amazing like seeing freestyle at the time because like it was real unique. Every single pro is completely different from each other. You have like the preppies, you know, the, the punk rockers, the rockers, the, the New England guys. It was eye-opening, I'll put it to you that way. We had to push the envelope at that point when we came home to really to maintain that level to think that we could become on the national stage. It, it basically kind of pushed a lot of us. No, it was, a, it was just awesome going to that, that part of the world because it's, it's kind of like you're out in the boonies or something, even though you're not really in the boonies, but it's just this, this, this netherland of what's going on out there. The AFA's first national expansion was in Fitchburg, Massachusetts in August of 1985. This was an icebreaker for New England and for the AFA itself. I'm a rider who's just riding going forward this way and Ron's over here just growing the sport behind us that we don't, we're not even sure what kind of stuff he's got going on. I'm not sure exactly how it happened but somehow we agreed that New England would be another area where uh, it was appropriate for the AFA to expand to. And Bob had confidence in, in us, in New England, me, to be able to put on some contests up there. I remember, you know, one of the big, the first big AFA competitions here in New England in Fitchburg um, was really our first chance to, to see some of the big California guys on the East Coast. And it was a thrill for me to see some of the guys I idolized that hadn't seen in person. Um, guys like Dominguez and Martin Aparijo in our own backyard competing with guys that I rode with every day. I just remember going there and just, just having a great time. I, I remember getting there and uh, I think one of the things that just blew me away is just everybody's whispering. Just, you know, who's that guy? You know, not, I don't know if they were saying who's that guy, but they were like talking and we're like, we're like going, hey, we're just going to get over here because back in the day our mentality was uh, we want to rip this place up. We want to we want to show them what we have. The first time any of the West Coast guys actually got to see Jeff Larson do his thing was in Fitchburg, and that was an eye-opener for all of them. I actually vaguely remember him giving a dime to someone, you know, before to, um, to make a phone call, I guess, to, to 911, I guess, if, if something went wrong during his routine. And Jeff Larson introducing the backwards, backwards drop into the world was, was, was his world. He didn't see what I saw, I didn't see what everybody else saw. He just saw that he was gonna do his tricks and there's no rational, there's no possibility of how to pull off a backwards, backwards drop. I don't know why he was trying it. He was just doing it and I, to this day, don't know answers of, of what he's thinking when he did that. But he just thought he could do it. And um, maybe he knows more than we knew about freestyle because maybe it is possible. Backwards, backwards, drop-ins. No one's done that to this day. So to see and see the reaction on Mike Dominguez's face as the guy who's the number one ramp rider in the world watches Jeff Larson go out and huck himself and pull some things and not pull others um, was pretty awesome. With the AFA success, Bob Morales brought the very first AFA Masters Finals to a cold and snowy Manchester, New Hampshire. It was the largest freestyle event to date, and the excitement was through the roof. There was a lot of excitement, I think, among everybody, because they're like, oh my god, you know, ooh, the pros from the West Coast are here, and, and now you're, you know, you're practicing with them, you're, you're, you're hanging out on the, on the deck with them. Manchester was our chance to shine as East Coasters. We had worked very hard, and now we had gotten the attention of California. They were coming to us for the first time. We have you on our turf and let's see what you can do. It was, it was definitely a game changer. It just, it changed how I, I looked at, at riding, totally. Manchester AFA contest was epic, <laughs> to say the least. It really, it really kind of opened your eyes to what was nationally as opposed to just what was around you. Uh, your mind was blown away. It's like, how do they go that big? Wow, I, I you know, could never imagine anyone going as high as those guys were then. There's a lot going on there. You had Woody Itson, you had Mike Dominguez, you had Ron Wilkerson, you had Arlo Osborne over here, and all these 
riders there. And, and uh, to be honest, I don't remember even trying to conversate with them because uh, uh, my job was there to to win. But when I showed up at the comp, it was like, I felt like I could really relate to all the guys from there because they were in the same boat as far as not having easy access to coverage and things like that. So we kind of connected on that level. Like, you know, they had st stuff that I'd never seen and vice versa. And it just spent the whole night like outside of the hotel session. This was our opportunity to get into, if you will, the inner sanctum of BMX. This was our opportunity to get noticed uh, that was a big one. We got a good amount of coverage. I think that that's really the one where the, the magazines and the people on the West Coast got a sense for how much was going on in New England, you know, what the quality of the riding was. Uh, at that level, again, talking about stepping up, it went from, right, a bunch of nerdy little kids with their tube socks um, who couldn't get enough of the California BMX magazines to, like, bringing it here having a, and owning our own version of it and perhaps we taught them a little bit too because of that. And meanwhile, under the ground, there was this, there was this amazing, unbelievable bubble of, ex this thing about to explode of talent that was being created here with all the riders from, from this area, you know, like Joe Johnson and Paul Delario and, and you know, Darren Pelly, all these guys that were, were coming, Chris Lashua, just all these guys that were coming up, they were just, ready to explode and, and burst onto the scene. And it finally did, and once that bubble popped, it was like, all right, we're here. You know, New England's here and people are seeing this. The contest and show scene was exploding following these massive events. Indoor jams were popping up all over New England, finally giving us an indoor place to ride year round. But Natick, Natick is sort of what started that more formal, like, I don't know, it was like the beginning of jam circle mentality, I feel like. Natick was, was like home. It was, my mom uh, ran the jam. She was in charge of the Explorer Post because that was our you know, excuse to, to, to get together and, and have insurance and, and ride and all that. There was a lot of the checking the other guy out going on, which I think helped bring it up another notch. Instead of like every other month going to a competition and seeing that, all of a sudden it got a little more frequent and you'd see those incremental steps happen quicker and quicker. When we started doing contests, John Cody started with the King of Flatland series, and that brought everybody together. We'd have Flatland contest with 150 people in it. Ramp riders, street riders, didn't matter. Everyone came and they rode Flatland and they had fun. The best way that we could learn tricks was to go to the King of Flatland competition. King of Flatland represented to me uh, a place to learn. There was just so much that you would pick up the little details of, oh, you just you keep your, you know, your weight centered on top of the axle peg. Boom, now instantly, you, you, you walked away from it with six new tricks every time. You know, it, it was all about improving each other. It was all about progress and creativity. The first contest we had back in 87, we had no idea what to expect. But when we walked in, we set everything up, and by 10 o'clock, I think we had about 50 people. And from there, it kind of snowballed. There's a lot of pressure, a lot of people. A lot of energy at that place. It was, it, was, it was really good, you know. Definitely pushed Flatland in New England. I think I got a new pair of vision shoes after a competition because I never really wanted to change my shoes right before a competition because you know you won't you won't be able to do your tricks anymore with new shoes. Up on deck is Rich Slavak, and just all of a sudden I got the shakes. I start sweating. I'm like, oh god, I got to perform. I never looked forward to competing. Um, the riders were very good. I was very intimidated. Uh, I had no confidence in myself. And because I had no confidence in myself, I think I over-prepared. I would practice my runs until I couldn't bend my fingers the next morning. You know, some of these guys, like Rich Upjohn and Tommy, and the level of the stuff they were doing with Flatland back then was through the roof, you know? And it was, it was uh, both like scary and really kind of encouraging at the same time. And at the time, they were just as good as the expert riders in you know, national contests, or the dudes you see in the magazines every month. 
were doing the same tricks that you'd see every month in New Hampshire, and they were just so intense. They didn't need to venture out. Everybody was there to cheer each other on and have fun, and if they got first place, awesome, and if they got last place, they still had fun. The jam circles at the Canada Flatland were a perfect example of that. Everyone went out, more or less, you took turns. It was amazing to see you know, someone like Rich would go in, do his trick, and people actually would stop and look around to see who was going to go in before they just ran in. You know, unless, of course, you're Keith McElhaney, and he just went in whenever he wanted to go in. To me, the jam circle was way more important than the contest was. You know, it, how people thought about you as a rider and how you proved yourself and it wasn't a contest, it was what you did before or after. So it was a little bit of an exhibition. It was a little bit of a practice session. Uh, it was a little bit of a demolition derby sometimes. I mean, this is a big gym, but with a lot of kids, weird positions. I saw some cool crashes. I just remember the first time I see him, before I really got to know Keith, I see him in the contest, and all of a sudden I see he goes over by the side to start clearing people. You'd see people making room. They're actually moving cones and barriers and trying to expand this already big contest thing. You know, we'd seen him do some fast roll weights, but then he decided that he's gonna go as fast as humanly possible. Pedaling mock speed as fast as he could. Every time it was faster and he just jumped and the whole place just went nuts. same time, we, the ERA started down in Rhode Island with Greg Souza, Kevin Robinson, Fred McDonald, all those guys, and they put on ramp contests, and the same thing. Flatlanders would come out and ride ramps, it was awesome. With the, the ERA contests, we just wanted to be all about the riders and just having fun. These guys were doing something totally different. We were all just riders showing up, building ramps out of nothing, thrashing themselves all weekend long, judging each other. A uh, massive sticker toss at the end of it all, you know, and there were no grown ups around at all. It was just them doing it for themselves, and you were one of them. It was freedom. We could do whatever we want. We could have contests when we want, where we want. We just had to do all the work. All of. Yeah, the startup is pretty good class. The rivalries in New England were pretty good. The biggest one had to be Joe Johnson versus the world. You know, I had a we had a little bit of rivalry with Scrob Maroney. He just went too high and it was annoying. Having Keith there, it always got interesting. The earliest riders in New England was a very small number, but it just mushroomed out to this huge scene over the course of 10 or 12 years. John Lawson, Darren Prescott, the Cruz brothers, what they learned and what they started, they passed on to Dennis Langley, Paul Delario, Matt Bennett, Jeff Larson. They then passed it up to Joe Johnson, you know, Brett Marshall, Chris Lashua, Ken Stranahan, Dak Woods, who then passed it to you know, myself, Keith McElhaney, Feliciano Soares, TJ Fallon. We then pass it up to Tommy Simpson, Kevin Robinson, John Cody, you know, all these guys that you just, and I didn't even mention everybody, but all these guys just kept coming back, you know, to that same original just nugget of raw energy to learn tricks and grow it that, you know, every one of us owes something to someone else, whether you were in the early part or in the later part. And you just look at the tricks as well, the tricks that came out of New England. 
the 360 drop-in, the 50-50, the Pelioroni, the double flare, the tail whip air. I mean, all these tricks, all the places that we all went to, China, Japan, Europe, South America, all these places, all these tricks, all come back to this couple of guys in the very beginning. And as it grows and grows and grows, it just becomes this big, huge thing that we all just loved and enjoyed. Pardon me if I may interrupt. Before we get saturated with statistics, I'd like to make perfectly clear one very important point. Whatever New England might be statistically, New England is people. So if we're going to understand the area, we'd better meet some of the people. As rad as the overall scene and individual riders were, there were six influential people who stood out. They took it further, rose to the highest levels, and made the brightest impression on our sport worldwide. And these are their stories. And over here to my far right, Chris Lashua from Ashburnham, and he is the director of his own company, Freestyle Performance. 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 Chris Lashua, that dude ripped. You know, Chris Lashua is just his own right. I mean, there's nobody else that was like that. I always thought he had like a lot of style, and which is a dialed dude. I, when he turned pro, I was still amateur at Manchester, but he turned pro there, and uh, he just killed it. I remember thinking, arguably, that he could have won that event. Chris Lash, I was always a kid, you know, so I, I only had a certain amount of strength. But I remember Chris Lashua always being able to pull tricks that just required a huge amount of strength and that I didn't have and I had no chance to, to pull any of those so I was really like looked up to him and I was so stoked when I saw our Chris Lashua on the cover of Freestyle Mix. I'm like wow one of our guys made it. He just he has a vision and he just knows how to move his way through it and get to that point that he sees even if everybody else along the way can't see it. Eventually they'll get it. Chris looked like he was having more fun than anybody else. He's just you know, doing his thing. He always had a big smile on his face, always came to the contest. I remember watching Chris, and he had a smile on his face the whole time he rode. And I could totally relate to that, because I've always been a showman, as many of you know. I saw him as a, a real strong potential in the area of showmanship, in the area of being a strong athlete. And he also was bright. Very, very bright young man. And last but not least, the owner and co-manager of the GT Mountain Dew Trick Team. He just came back from the West Coast where he's been touring with Eddie Viola. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Lashua, Team Dino. Let's hear it for Chris. I think that the there were a handful of people going out there and doing shows. And so we were always trying to find a way, like, you know, how are we going to make our show better? Um, and not just better, like better than the other BMX team down the street, but but how are we going to make something that's like going to be cool for 30 minutes? You know, so we thought about it big picture. We thought about it like, you know, what kind of shows do we like watching, and what are the things that drive them? I, I was looking at an old video of one of the first shows I did. There's no music on it. And I'm like I look at it now and I think, how the heck did we? What were we doing? There's no music. You know, music was a big part of it. You know, we would we would sit down and we would kind of hash out. Um, putting all these songs together. It wasn't just about like, okay, we want to play all rock and roll or all rap or whatever it was. You know, we really were trying to think about like, okay, look, we're doing a, we're doing a, a show for an audience of like a few hundred people, sometimes 50 people at a bike shop, sometimes a thousand people at a fair. And so we would, you know, we try to approach it like, okay, how are we going to keep, you know, grandma and grandson and everybody entertained, you know? So we would approach it like that and we would have like a full range of music. We would have stuff that was like, for us, it was a bit of a joke, you know. I remember we had this thing with Bach, and it was like this, like really kind of orchestra, orchestral kind of arrangement. And then, you know, um, Scott would come along and blast the big air, and then do this big, huge, um, you know, this big yeah, you know, on the on the on the soundtrack. And then, boom, we'd be into another piece of music. And it was really about like arranging the music to support the show and kind of laying out the whole show in advance, you know, not just. Okay, we're gonna go out there and okay, you go, I go, you go, I go. Um, we kind of planned it out and, and it got, you know, we got a little bit more advanced as time went on. And 
we did a lot of shows. I mean, part of the reason that it was able to get to that level and that we were able to kind of really think about the show is that we did a lot of shows. And it was really possible because Ron put the Mountain Dew thing together. We had Pepsi Cola buying shows every weekend. There was a different bottler in a different market buying shows. Fairs, festivals, malls, shopping malls. We got to do a lot of shows. And that's the only way you get good in anything. I mean, I don't care whether it's basketball or, or freestyle, skating, whatever. You gotta put in the time. And, and um, we put in the time. We put in the time not just training, not just practicing, but actually being in front of people. And that, seeing what people react to, seeing what people don't react to, seeing how, you know, in certain environments people, you know, would really just kind of be really put off by certain music and other places it would work really well. Um, I think early on we realized that we weren't doing the show just for our friends. And that was, that was key. That, that changed how we put the shows together. Say goodbye, Chris. Look out. Whoa. Did you like that one? Dennis was the first rider from New England to elevate his riding level to be competitive with the best riders in the world. He essentially shattered the glass ceiling that we all perceived was there, that you couldn't be a guy from New England and be on that level. Joe Johnson and all the other riders that follow from New England benefited from Dennis just shattering this glass ceiling. It's difficult to trick that, you, that you've seen. Uh, probably one of the most difficult tricks nowadays uh, for ramp riding is the 540. Yeah, he, I just remember his arms, his elbows out, flat tabletop. But you see, he always got really good air, you know what I mean? And he'd come in. A, uh, a lot of times, you, you probably noticed it on quarter pipe bears back in the day, they'd come up like this and they'd come up back wheel landing. Dennis was good at coming in front wheel landing, and that's how you want to come in. And he, he picked it up. So I just remember him having real clean, real clean airs and real good airs. And you could always see, you could always tell if a guy was uh, confident in his riding, they'd go up and they'd kind of sketch, like, oh, uh, not quite, you know, but he would go up and it was, he meant it and came in, you know, firm and, and he knew what he was doing. So it was awesome. People like, you know, Dennis Langley's. Don't, that, that AFA Masters competition in, in Manchester, New Hampshire. He was going just as high as Dominguez was going. Dude probably didn't get the chance to ride probably nearly as much as Mike did. Mike's out here in beautiful California. Dennis is out in Whitensville, Cal in Whitensville Mass. He's just going just as high. How do you get that? How do you get to that level of equivalency dealing with the certain conditions and environment conditions they had to have. One day, I get a call from Jeff Larson, and he tells me, we gotta get to Dennis's right away. Dennis is doing 10 foot airs. So, I go pick Jeff up, and we go over to Dennis's house, and all of a sudden, the session ensues, and Dennis is really hitting 10 foot airs. And all I could think was, wow, he's going as high as the guys out west now. Things are about to change. Good just to work up a sweat today, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty hot and humid out here. I'm so used to the San Diego weather. Practicing all day on dry, dry heat air at 75 degrees. <laughs> how, how many uh, hours of practice do you, do you put in during a day, Dennis? Um, as far as practice goes, probably three solid hours a day. But um, more or less, it's just riding the bike all day long until night. And sometimes we even, the sport is getting so um, technical now that we're, most of the kids are riding all night long until morning. That's a, how intense it is. So they're putting, some kids are putting eight hours a day in sometimes, right, all day long and all night and then sleep till like three o'clock in the afternoon. I mean, Dennis is a motivator. He's a challenger. He's, he's, he's got a competitive spirit that you don't find in your everyday person. He really wants to drive somebody to go better. He wanted to make things happen. 
he was fearless in a lot of ways. A lot of the freestylers are fearless. That's a part of what they're about. Um, so when Dennis had opportunity to travel, it's almost like it was natural. It wasn't like you had to pull teeth to get him to go anywhere because he was ready to go. Family was ready to let him go. And, and he had the confidence to be able to do that. A lot of young people today probably wouldn't have that confidence to travel. So he had, he had a lot of, uh, he felt secure in himself. And I think that's one thing that freestyle does is it gives the young people confidence. And, and the traveling aspect, good grief, you get to see the world. There are, we've, I've ridden so many ramps, and there are some ramps that, like I remember the one Dennis talks about in, in Europe, where it's, it's a, literally two by fours going up this, this makeshift ramp thing. And, and the, the funny part is, is that, you know, I, being from California, ridden a lot of skate parks, ridden a lot of, you know, really good ramps. Uh, Dennis and I go to Europe and we start riding this stuff, and, and Dennis, Dennis, just happy, giddy kid, just riding, want to ride, want to ride. And I'm going, this stuff sucks. You know, I'm not going to ride this. This is not even close to being the quarter pipe I'm used to riding. But the problem is, is now Dennis is riding it and, and he's getting air. And it's six foot wide, six foot tall, going up this thing. And I'm going, these suck. I got to ride it now because you're riding it, I gotta ride it. And not only do I gotta ride it, I gotta go higher than Dennis. So now Dennis and I are in this competition against ourselves, but nobody knows this. And Dennis knows this, and I know this. And we're just going higher and higher and higher to where it's this big, huge show, and we it made the day. Oui, il y en a qui vient de Boston, Langlas, et Piola, qui est le fameux champion californien. Being a touring, professional for GT, I got the unique opportunity to travel around the world. I got to visit almost every single country in Europe, South America, and some of the ramps I had to go ride were just unbelievably bad, uh, unfortunately. I remember one time I went with Brian Skura to Venezuela, Caracas, Venezuela, and we were out there for two weeks. We had to do shows on a ramp that was literally two by fours, actually I take that back. The bottom was a door, and then up would be like a two by six, and then a couple of two by fours, and then up. And I am not exaggerating. A door, two by sixes, two by fours, it, was, it wasn't plywood at all. It was like, I don't know what or where they got this idea that this was a ramp, but I don't know where I, what or where I got the idea to actually ride it, but when you got, 600 people just dying to see you ride and GT starting to open a, a new area of sales, you, you do what you do. And uh, yeah, it was quite the, quite the thing. And over in Bercy, both uh, Eddie and I got to ride a ramp that was about five feet wide, I believe, maybe six to max. And we got about 30 minutes to practice on it, which was just, something else. It was in this stadium called Bercy, right in the middle of Paris. And it's a, a velodrome situation and they put us on the track to do a show. And in the middle of the track was 500 people having dinner, like a five course dinner, like first class dinner. And they had the velodrome race around it and we were entertainment. And they put these two quarter pipes back to back, five, six feet wide. The curb was great, but the bottom we just went like this, like literally like this, and then it would go up like that. And we had to go and ride these things. You know, it was just, I don't know how we did it. I really don't. I think it was just kind of like you had no choice. But uh, we ended up getting four, five, six feet of air off that thing. <laughs> and I guess it was just each other, both of us pushing each other. But it was crazy because these ramps were just, nothing like what we rode in California or in the East Coast. 
tables du centre sont allumées en attendant ceux qui viendront dîner tout à l'heure à partir de 19h puisque vous savez que les soirées du POPB après un début un peu difficile mercredi et jeudi il n'y avait pas beaucoup de monde sauf au parterre où tout était plein et eh bien depuis vendredi c'est archi comble Eddy Fiola Denis Langlas à gauche Fiola à droite Langlas champion du monde et champion d'Amérique du Nord, Danny Langlas. I've never seen anybody else ride like Darren. Darren was like a precision machine. He was really intense and just over and over and over. He was a natural athlete, but he just combined it with incredible work, incredible work ethic. Yeah, I mean, he was just so dialed and just spun so fast. Like, I really, I love Darren's riding style without a doubt. Darren practice, you know, you learn a lot from, from him, just how, you know, dedicated he was. And I think the execution part of it, I mean, in a sport with so much variety and so much change, I think it was still important when you went out there to, to you know, to pull it off. Brian and I would, go home and watch tapes of his KOF runs over and over and over to the extent that we knew every single trick. If there was a bobble or a touch, we knew where it was. We knew every single song and what routine it went with. And you can't hear Billy Idol without thinking of uh, Darren. Well, he, Darren was very detailed. You know, he, he would, you would watch him do a trick and he would do the same trick a thousand times over and over and over again. And you would see the aggravation, and you know, you could see that he's aggravated. And say, Darren, what, what's going on? You know, he didn't want to talk to anybody, he just wanted to be left alone. And Todd and I, and I think anybody else, would look at what he was doing as perfect, saying, he just nailed it a hundred times in a row. And something just wasn't a hundred percent right with him. And he was the type of guy who would just keep going until he, until he felt that it was a hundred percent. We couldn't say it. And you have to train. You have to keep your reflexes so that when you want it, it's there. When you want to move, you're moving. And when you move, you are determined to move. Not taking one inch, not anything less than that. We set a standard for ourselves that we want to adhere to. And we're not pleased until we get to that standard. I think it's just the expectations that we put on ourselves, whether it's riding or whatever, whatever is in life, as, as being who I am or who my family is, we put high expectations on who we are. If we don't achieve it, then we're not happy. We're miserable. And then we're miserable anyway, because even if we get to that point, guess what? We want to get to the next point, and we're still unhappy. You know, we're still unhappy until we keep getting better, until I guess we die. What I remember 90% of, it's not the people, it's not the sponsorship offers, it's not, some of it's traveling to this place and that place, but 90% of what I remember is cracks in the pavement and the texture of the tar and different parking lots and garages I've ridden at over the years and thinking like why I like this one, why I didn't like this one, and the lighting was good at this one. To this day, if I'm driving by a parking lot or flying over a parking lot in a plane, I look at that parking lot and think, Lighting's good, the texture of the tar looks good, that'd be a nice place to ride. And that, that's 90% of what I think about. And when I, when I go back and think about riding, it's that vision of looking down. Handlebars, brakes, tar. Doing a trick, okay, there's an area about five by seven here that doesn't have a crack in it, so I could do my spinning trick there. I better go past the crack and come out and approach it from the level area and do my G-turn there and finish in the area that's level and spin over there. So thinking about how the tar is lined up, where the cracks in the pavement are, and trying to orient how you're going to do your combos so you can pull it and not get stuck in some unlevel area. That's 90% of flatland. It's you and asphalt. It, it sounds ridiculous, but it's a very lonely existence.
Ball, Ron Foot with Cooper, Megan Air. <laughs> My, my gooseneck slip, my hand about to To anybody else, Joe Johnson was just another neighborhood kid, but he wasn't. Just such a humble kid that came in and was just busting out. You know, I heard all these, you know, all these stories about this guy, Joe Johnson. Yeah, of course, Joe Johnson. He was, he was our guy. He was the, the guy that we all rooted for because he was one of us. And, you know, he's, a, he's just a, you know, swamp Yankee like the rest of us who made good. He got on Team Haro. And... But seeing him ride in his backyard, to be there, that was incredible. I mean, a lot of people in the scene know Joe from Haro in his later GT days, but seeing this 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 kid that just real quiet kid get on a bike and bam, bigger than life, Joe. <laughs> Backyards of Joe. I hear like, oh yeah, there's some ramp in Stoughton. I'm like, oh, all right, let's go check this out. And so I ride over the next town over and the backwoods of Stoughton. And we get into this neighborhood and there's this ranch house. Uh, and we pull up, and we go in the backyard, and there is this just BMX freestyle paradise. It's this quasi quarter pipe, semi half pipe, built onto the back of the house with a deck. Uh, this roll in, if I remember, went up into the woods. I mean, Joe had this rickety extension that ran up into the woods. It was like he was the only one. Him and TJ were the only one light enough to run up and down this thing, and they were hitting the they were hitting the ramp at like top speed. Joe's getting like 12 foot doing, you know, one footed inverts like over the roof of his house. We were just absolutely dumbfounded. Wendy Osborne came to Joe Johnson's house for a shoot and the ramps were full of riders, but it was pretty clear at some point that everybody should step aside because this was just the most amazing ramp session we had ever seen. A man has got to realize what his limits are. And at that point, I set my bike aside, sat on the roof of Joe's house, and just said to myself, is this for real? That one particular photo shoot is probably at the top of my list with a handful of others, maybe. Looking at the contact sheets, and we're just like, we gotta run that one big, we gotta run that one big. And it was tough. During those edit, uh, edit sessions on, on the photos, we were gonna run in each issue. Everyone got to bring out a different colored Sharpie and you'd like make dots on the slides and dots on the contact sheets before we go and develop the, the black and white. And there's just tons of dots on everything and it's always like, uh, would take so much longer when you have too many, too many good ones to, to choose from, you know? And there's one shot where the tire, it's just, you know, it's like you could bite the tire. And through the spokes, with the motion and everything are the people on the other side on the ramp. And I love that picture. I just, there was just, there was a lot of motion and there was a lot, I mean, all his moves were maxed and pushed and. I think he just didn't have the fear uh, or he didn't care. Joe comes flying in and hits that ramp and I had never seen a human being go so high on a wooden quarter pipe in my life. I was stupefied watching this kid ride. I mean, it's just sheer, talent and, and just, you know, it was pure because there was no pretense of the factory rider. There was no elitism or I'm the best there is. It was just this kid on his bike on a ramp in his backyard. The thing about it was his riding was effortless. And, uh, you know, you're always heard about Brian Blyther or you see the, one of the videos or something like that. You think about how smooth these guys were. But Joe was... I mean, it was like, it was, it was just truly effortless and there was nothing that, that made sense because I would try to do stuff that Joe did and it was really, really hard. I think Joe perfected the high air. There were a lot of riders that were getting height, but Joe, come on. I mean, Hoffman got some crazy air, Kevin gets some crazy air, but back then, 
there wasn't anybody that could touch Joe. You know, I never dreamed of doing it on, on Bert. I mean, I, I take that back. At some point I did, but when we learned it, there was no way. And then uh, Joe turned it up and ended up doing doubles and being one of the smoothest riders ever, Joe. Uh, I looked up to Joe when he was an amateur and I was pro. Well, I saw Joe try and tell whips when we were in, in Europe. Like we were over there, like on the Danube, like a topless beach off the freaking Danube River. Dennis and I were in this warehouse. We're riding, we're riding all day and uh, you know, I'm mainly working on this tail whip all day, and, and he just thought it was a joke. You know, he didn't think it was uh, it was worth the effort, and there's, you know, there, there, it's not going to lead to anything. It's not, you know, it's not going to be a trick. I, you know, that that's worth worth trying. You're not going to be able to pull it off. And, and come on, Johnson, give that thing up. Let's go. Come on, let's do, let's have some fun. Let's do some airs. You know, that sort of thing. I, I and I, I can yeah, I can remember to, you know tell him that day that uh, no, I think I think I, this is it, it probably looked it felt like it was close, but the way he was seeing it. It was probably the reality that it was just, I was, I was a lot further away from landing it than I thought. But, but for me, it, it felt like I was, I was pretty close to landing it, you know. Um, but yeah, my, my weight was, you know, it was just way too towards the ramp and I was vertical, probably, you know. You know, it, it uh, for, for the most part, it's, a lot of it's instinct, you know, as, as you're, um, as the bike is coming around, your, your, your feet are just like magnets to the to the pedals. You know, they they they, they just they just seem to know where they're supposed to go almost. You know, when, so when it's when the bike's coming around, and you know you 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 know early on, you feel like you've you've uh, you're gonna pull it, or you know pretty quickly whether or not you, you need to uh, bail out or not. But um, you just you know you, you're you're looking to see how fast you know how fast the frame's coming around and how much time you have before you're gonna hit the ground and. Uh, you know, you kind of figured out how that time is going to work out, and um, balancing that between your, 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 how your weight's positioned relative to the, the coping and all these things. The main thing is, is your is your weight. You know, you, you, if if uh, if your weight isn't in the right place, you know, the, uh, all bets are off. And like I, you know, the, the the double tail whip was even more. It was the same thing as running the first, you know the, the single tail whip, where um, I could never commit to. The trick, leaning, you know, leaning in, and I can remember Dave Mira when uh, Dave was learning that trick too. He kept, you know, he, he and I we talked about it a bunch, you know, where you just got to commit. You got, you have to lean in, you have to lean in, and and uh, you know, and then that that was that, that was that was the thing. That was the thing for um, you know a, a lot of the tricks in BMX really is you need to commit to the trick and 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 think you're going to think and know you're going to pull it. how many times he had tried it in the past, but it was pretty obvious that because other people were starting to do the tail whip now, it was obvious that Joe needed to take it to another level and do the double tail whip. Speaking of the tail whip, think about who, like how that, how that trick became what it is now. Is is that uh, Brian Blyther invented the flatland trick, the tail whip. He's a vert rider. Dominguez did this, uh, this fly out tail whip thing, and then and I did a, this tail whip air. And, and uh, but to, if it started started with a vert rider, Blyther doing it on the ground. A lot of people, yeah, you know, I was probably the first one to do the tail whip above vert. Oh, that's <laughs> Might have been on my back on the deck, but. Yeah, so it goes Blyther, yeah. uh, Dominguez, then me, then Joe. That's funny. And, and it was a fun victory for New England. You know, it was, it was, this is it, it's our boy. You know, hats off uh, to Mr. Johnson for pulling that one off. 
I feel so naive now knowing that like triple whips have been pulled and quad whip jumps and and I could like do so many tail whip flatland tricks it just seems so naive but it didn't seem like it was gonna work to me I just remember thinking like yeah keep it up buddy good luck with that one <laughs> and then, and then like, like he's double whipping a few comps later you know I was like okay well oops kind of missed that one sport and you'd like to know a little bit more about it there's a man standing over there with a video camera now who's uh, the director of the American Freestyle Association in the Northeast and he'd be glad to talk to you uh, after our show. I think Ron Stebbin was like the James Brown of New England uh, freestyle he, he was like the godfather of the, the soul godfather of soul right here. The fucking chicken. Well, you know, and I always feel like with Ron, it was, it was one of those cases where was, you guys need a leader, you know, follow me. Ron Stebbin had his little organization with these guys, and it was really impressive. You know, it's like, you know, these guys got their, got their stuff together. I remember Ron announcing, I mean, these things are like kind of ingrained in my memory, all the Ron announcing, like that's just part of the collective unconscious of, um, you know, Northeast Freestyle. This is the director of Freestyle Promotions. Here's Ron Steben. Then we met uh, this guy, Ron Steben. Ron Steben. Then Ron Steben. The Ron Steben. The Ron Steben. Ron Steben. Ron Steben was a cool guy. Ron's the nicest guy in the world. You know, I really, I have to thank Ron Steben. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Ron Steben for putting as much time and effort and taking a chance on a bunch of kids um, to put things together and make something happen that in our region of the country probably shouldn't have happened, but it did. Well, Ron, I mean, Ron Stebbin, the, I don't think our scene would have been half what it was without him. You know, I, mean, I wouldn't be sitting here right now if it wasn't for Ron Stebbin because he, you know, kind of brought all this stuff around here. It's hard to picture what it might have been like without him um, because he was really kind of the glue that held it together in the early days. If you were a kid growing up in Rhode Island or Massachusetts or anywhere outside of California, you would think that, well, it's too bad I can't do this because I don't live in California. But Ron Stebbins showed us it didn't have to be like that. In some ways, the guys like Ron were smart enough to recognize that, yeah, this thing is kind of out there, it's a little bit edgy. And to get people to take a chance on it, they need to kind of reel us in a little bit. The word grassroots really comes from Ron Stebbins, you know, in his own way. I remember him saying it. Back in the old day, it's like grassroots, and uh, a lot of marketing companies sometimes don't understand that, but it really is the grassroots, and he is the king of grassroots. Freestyle in New England was essentially, if you look at it like a wheel, we were all individual spokes, the individual riders. Ron Stebbin was the hub of that bigger wheel. Well, if there was a connection, <clears throat> If I was a connector, I would say that as, as you have an idea and you express that idea to, to other people and the other people somehow fit into that idea, they become a community. So those spokes actually become a community. And that community uh, has legs that reach out further. And as you... Um, as time goes by, it becomes a bigger and bigger community. Throughout time, there's folks that drop off along the way because of one reason or another. They don't want to focus in that area or they have to move on. When you're in the center of it, you don't have necessarily the luxury of just dropping out because you get tired of it. You don't have the luxury of saying, okay, uh, I need, a, I need a, a break. Because if, if you're in the center of something, and you have a responsibility to that which is out and around that center, there's a lot of weight on you to continue moving forward regardless of what the circumstances are. But it isn't so much like a drudgery, like you have to do it because of other people. It's because those other people, you feed off of their energy, you feed off of their, their love for you. You're given value as a person by what you do for others in a lot of ways. So if you're at the center of an activity, and I, if you say I'm a center of this situation, 
then I had value to a lot of people. And that, that to me is empowering. He's been there since the beginning. He's been there since King of Flatlands, Kinder Shows, X Games. And he's a true professional and he represents the sport great and he's one of us. You knew when Kevin was young, when you first met him, that he was gonna take it further than anybody. He saw what he wanted to do and he just wouldn't stop until it, was, until it happened. Kevin Robinson is the most successful rider ever to come from New England, period. Really, my memories of, of Kevin are when he started coming to the, the BS comps. Out of the blue, there was pretty much just four pros competing at the time, which is myself, Matt Hoffman, Dave Mira, and Jay Miron. And out of the blue, this kid shows up from Rhode Island. Uh, you know, like, he, he had gone to two hip comps, so I kind of knew him, but he showed up and signed up in pro at, uh, at Scrap and went for a nine. He didn't pull it, but gained everybody's respect instantly. Like, oh, this. This guy ain't playing around. Little Kevin Robinson is just a little grom, like <laughs> little little kid, like helping us. And then like years later, he was riding. What? And then he's like bodybuilding. Like what? Little little Kevin. <laughs> he just seemed to have a little more fire in his eye, a little more spark to just to just go big. You know, people ask me all the time, like you know, what's your what's your what's your dream trick? What's something you've always wanted to do? And and I would tell people a double flare, and they would always look at me like I had three heads, you know. And I just, I envisioned what it would look like, and I couldn't get that vision out of my head. You know, I just constantly would sit there and lay there at night in bed, and that vision would just float through my head and float through my head and wake me up sometimes in the middle of the night, you know. And I just, I knew that it could be done, you know. And no matter who I brought it up to, they just thought I was crazy and thought it couldn't be done. Which makes me even more eager to show that it can be done, you know? So, um, you know, I started working on breaking down the mechanics of it into the foam pit, and uh, Robin, actually, my wife, was a huge help. She was a former gymnast, and, you know, she kind of helped fix some of the little things I was doing wrong. And a gentleman by the name of Frank Bear, who is an Olympic uh, pro skier, and also a stuntman, he walked up one day and he said, well, just do this and this, and told me how to, like, tuck my shoulder a little different, and. You know, counter, counter turn so I wouldn't start rotating on the first flip. And by doing that, all of a sudden I started coming around in the foam pit and I, I was doing it. You know, and so that, that was groundbreaking for me is just knowing that it can be done. There is a possibility and that's all I need. I just need a little shed of light and a shed of possibility and then I'll take it and run with it. You know, and that's exactly what I did. You know, and for three years, I tried that trick over and over and over, and it got to where I was just very comfortable trying it. You know, I just, you know, right at the very end, I just quite couldn't get that oomph to, to land it, you know? So, you know, I, it's funny, because I've never pulled that trick on a resi, you know, um, I, not one time. I felt more comfortable just trying on the real ramp. You know, I just, I'm like, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna put the effort into it and go for it, I'm more apt to give it a little more oomph and a little more effort by trying on a ramp, so I'd rather do it there. So for three years, well over 50 times, you know, I, you know, I fractured my each elbow, um, I fractured my wrist, uh, fractured my tailbone, and two concussions all off of trying this one trick that people still continue to tell me was impossible. And you know, finally, you know, I tried it at X Games in 05. I tried it a handful of times, and one time was so close. I thought I had it, but I didn't get it in time. So, so the next year for the 2006 X Games, you know, BMX best trick, that's, I went there, that's all I wanted to do. I just, I wanted to ride away from that trick. And, you know, I dropped in, I said, you know, I'm probably not going to pull it the first shot. I'm going to do one just to get it under my belt and feel, feel ready to do it. And that's exactly what I did. I dropped in and I tried one and I slid out and right then I knew this next time I'm pulling this. This is it. I, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the right frame of mind right now. All my stars are aligned. Everything's right. It's going to happen tonight. I got goosebumps right now, Jimmy. I think he's got one thing on his mind, and it's the double. 
I dropped in, and right when I took off, I knew. I just, it, that still gives me goosebumps. You know, like just that feeling, that feeling of taking off and just knowing, knowing that I can do this, knowing that I'm gonna land this. and coming around and looking and spotting the ramp as I come around after the second flip and that feeling of going through me as soon as my tires hit the ramp. And that's, uh, you know, I've talked about so many times is that moment. We all, we all live for that moment. And it's, it's that moment right there when my tires hit the ramp and I knew I was riding away. It's that moment. And, it, and it's different for everybody. It can, be, it can be passing a test at school in a subject that you're struggling with. You get a test back and you have an A on it. It's that moment right there. Or that one thing you're always afraid to do and you finally did it. And it's that moment. And that moment is what we live for. And that, to me, is that triumphs any medal, any trophy, any award, or any amount of money you'll ever get. Nothing can replace that moment. And that was probably the, one of the, if not the biggest moment of my BMX career, for sure. That's what bike riding is about. That's why I ride a bike, that right there. If you love riding and have that passion for riding, he appreciates that and he, I don't think he ever lost it. He, it's cool to see that in his eyes that he still just has a passion for getting on his bicycle. Freestyle to me and BMX, the whole history of it for me from being a little kid all the way to the point where I'm at is, you know, unmeasurable. But there's something about getting on a bicycle and trying to hop over something or trying to ride down something really steep. The, uh, the thrill of the challenge is still there and I hope I never lose it. I feel like you just, you never look at life the same. It's like, it's somehow it's in here, you know? I don't feel, I never fear uh, failing. And I think that has a lot to do with free stuff. I see people doing it in Estonia, and they're saying the exact same things. They just want to be a part of something where they can have fun with their friends. And I say to myself, that is what it's all about. Go harder. <laughs> yeah! Mr. Bob Morales. It was a wicked ride. I did it. Wow. New England. Dennis, Dennis always outrode me. There was one time I can remember that he didn't. I'm just so hungry right now. The first ribs we did was just so wrong. You guys thought we just said ribs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do believe that one day, should I be 70 years old walking past the store with my grandchild, if I see a handrail, I'll be thinking of grinding it. Do you want some free shots still, or do you want just one? I want this one more, more jogging. You have Joe well, on that camera. Bring that over here, we can do a keep ball. Joe, you need to make notes, I've got a pad here for you. Uh, notes, huh? Yeah. Turn off, you take it off. Well, <laughs> now, should, they, should these two guys be in?
I never got to spend a lot of time with my father, but he actually bought me my first bicycle and got me into bike riding, you know, and, which is kind of a cool tie-in for someone you didn't really get to spend a lot of time with in your life. Well, I got an office attention for calling Chris Bartholomew. Well, it was like a field trip to Boston. Not because I, you know, did anything wrong, but because I didn't ask my teacher if I could use the public pay fund. Here I am, you know, I was at 17, I, I win, win my first contest, and Kevin Robinson's giving me a, a set of Paradigm 48s, and, you know, my brother bouncing up and down, and his little brother just won a contest, and, you know, he's all proud, and my little brother, and, it was, uh, it was a good moment. You know, you have your, you're looking up to your brother all your life, and here you are, winning a, winning a contest. It's, you know, it's pretty, pretty good time. And next time <laughs> he'll be riding expert. That's right. You got catted that's, up that day. Yeah, that's what Kevin said. <laughs> I, I think one of my favorite things about the whole hero, talking about like having idols and having heroes and thinking about that stuff is, I think we've always treated it a little bit different. Then, you know, like you talk about somebody who loves baseball or loves football, and that's a sport you watch. You know, it's, you know, people that do it usually do it until high school and then they're done. So a really small cross section of your life. And I think that, you know, we've always judged our, oh, I don't have any heroes. You know what I mean? Like I have, I have guys I've always looked up to. And, and I've had, but the thing is, is that like, I always, I think we always used our heroes as our benchmark. You know, it wasn't something that like, oh, I idolize that guy. And, you know, I want to just watch him do what he does. No, it's like you watch him do that and you go, all right, well, I'm pretty much going to start figuring out how to do what he just did. And so, you know, with that said, I think that, I, I think we all have always tried to be our own hero. Yeah, it's pretty unique. My dad helped my friends too if they need any help with anything because he used to do it. So when he would, he'll do a bar run though, and it won't look hard at all. But when, when I try it, I feel like I'm going to die. You know, I, I feel like I'm going to flip over right away. And then I give up on it. I'm like, I'm not doing that. You know, what can I add? What combo can I add to with a bar and though? But back in the day, they, they did it for fun. You know, people love that. But you know, I, I don't find the need to do that now. One, two, three. Oh, wicked ride. Oh, wicked ride. <laughs> you know, with, with BMX, you, it, it changes the way you look at life. You know, you still, to, I don't care how old you get, and how, even if you haven't ridden bikes for a long time, you still have that, that drive inside you that's down, down in the pit of your stomach. You still have that something where you drive by and you see a, a roof on a building that's shaped like a ramp. And that first thought that goes through your head is, imagine riding that. You know, it's, it's, it's not, well, that's a nice shingle job. They did a great job. The construction of that roof is amazing. That doesn't matter. That's nothing, none of that matters. It's you look at that and go, wow, oh, imagine an air on that? That'd be crazy. You know, it, or you can be inside somewhere and you look up at a ceiling and it's rideable if you flip it upside down. And that's the first thing that pops into your head. You know, that never leaves you. That stays in your head for as long as you live. I hope to be riding my freestyle BMX bike and ripping aerials and rollbacks until I'm 100 years old. And, you know, God willing, I will.